Hello, I'm Eric Strong, a clinical assistant professor at Stanford University, and this is the first video in a course on hemostasis. The overall learning goals for this course will be to understand the normal process of hemostasis, to identify likely disorders of hemostasis, to use diagnostic tests appropriately in order to diagnose these disorders, and last, to know the various medications used in the treatment of hemostatic disorders, including their mechanisms, indications, and side effects. The primary target audience for this series is graduate students in the health sciences, including medical students, as well as medical and pediatric health staff. The general public may find the course interesting and helpful as well, though some of the videos, particularly the second and third, will be relatively technical. For the course, I'll be assuming some knowledge of college-level biochemistry and very basic cell biology, but not assuming any specific knowledge of physiology or medicine. Essentially, if you've completed undergraduate pre-medical training, that will be more than adequate background. The learning objectives, specifically of this first video, covering the course introduction, will be to describe the main learning goals and organization of this 14 video course, to list the major challenges students encounter while trying to understand hemostasis, to list the major stages of hemostasis and describe their relationships to one another, and last, to contrast typical presentations of patients with platelet disorders versus coagulation disorders. Here's the outline for this course. As you know, this first video is the introduction. Lessons two and three will cover the normal physiology of hemostasis. Lesson four will cover tests of hemostasis, such as the PTT and INR, along with many other less well-known tests. Lessons five through seven will cover the various classes of medications relevant to the topic. Eight through 10 will discuss platelet disorders. 11 and 12 will cover disorders of the coagulation cascade and fibrinolysis. And finally, in lessons 13 and 14, I'll go over several example cases, starting with a clinical vignette of a patient with a disorder of coagulation, and then work through what the appropriate diagnostic tests would be for that individual and how to interpret a hypothetical set of results. So with all of those logistics out of the way, let me ask, why is learning hemostasis so hard? When I was in medical school, as well as in residency, this was among my least favorite topics. It seemed like no matter how much I studied it, I could never fully understand it, and I forgot the details so quickly, it made me wonder why I bothered to learn those details in the first place. Looking back on my training now, many years later, I think there are five basic reasons why hemostasis is so difficult to learn. First, the most obvious. Hemostasis is a very complex process. There are countless receptors, enzymes, and cofactors involved, each of which is given a numerical designation or acronym, making it hard to even remember their names, let alone their relationships to one another. Second, a relatively large amount of this complexity is relevant for the routine care of patients with hemostatic conditions. Without a firm grasp of the fundamental biology, it's impossible to treat hemostatic conditions appropriately. So in other words, there's no Cliff Notes version of the topic. The third reason why learning hemostasis is hard is that different resources provide information which superficially appears inconsistent with one another. Consider the general topic of platelet activation, which we'll talk about in the next video. If one performs a Google image search for platelet activation, you'll find dozens of diagrams similar to these. Some of the same acronyms will show up on different diagrams, but if you look more closely, there are many differences in how they illustrate what is supposed to be the same phenomenon. Fourth, many clotting factors, receptors, and even processes have more than one name. Here's a table of the body's clotting factors, all of which are assigned a Roman numeral designation, but also which have one or more older historical names. In common practice, generally clinicians default to one choice only. For example, I've literally never heard someone refer to fibrinogen as factor 1, or refer to factor 10 as Stuart Prower factor. Nevertheless, the alternative names are still out there in the literature and in textbooks. Worse than the factors, however, are platelet receptors with two completely different nomenclatures that are used interchangeably in clinical practice. The last reason hemostasis is hard to learn 
is that our collective understanding of it has evolved significantly in recent years. With most areas of physiology, the details necessary to know for routine clinical medicine have been well established for a generation. However, with hemostasis, this is not the case. Consider this diagram outlining the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways in the coagulation cascade. I'll talk much more about this in the third video, but if you've ever looked at a review book to study hemostasis, or found another video online that discusses it, you almost certainly came across a picture similar to this one. Unfortunately, the parallel intrinsic and extrinsic pathways don't represent actual physiology, but rather their existence seems to be a consequence of the limitations of lab testing methodology. Now, this is a fairly recent revelation, and although modern medicine understands this, and it's well explained in recent review articles, most textbooks that are even just 5 or 10 years old likely fail to describe this problem and also fail to describe coagulation in the most accurate way possible. At this point, I'm going to provide an extreme general overview of hemostasis as a taste of what's to come in lessons 2 and 3. This varies depending on how one chooses to divide it up, but I think of hemostasis as having overall three separate phases. After vascular injury, the very first response, which is essentially instantaneous, is local vasoconstriction. This is immediately followed by something called platelet activation, which consists of a series of changes in the expression and activity of certain receptors on the pl uh, platelet membrane, as well as changes in platelet shape. A few minutes later, the coagulation cascade kicks in, simultaneous with antithrombotic control mechanisms to prevent coagulation from running away too far. Since they occur extremely rapidly, the processes of vasoconstriction and platelet activation are sometimes lumped together under the term primary hemostasis. The coagulation cascade is referred to as secondary hemostasis. Last, there is the phase of fibrinolysis, when the body breaks down the blood clot and normal vessel patency is reestablished. This next diagram will go through those components in slightly greater detail and will introduce the seven key proteins involved in hemostasis. So once again, the very first reaction to vascular injury is vasoconstriction, followed by platelet activation, which is largely mediated by exposure of collagen to receptors in the platelet surface. Platelet activation results in a change in platelet shape and allows platelet aggregation which is mediated largely by proteins called von Willebrand factor and fibrinogen. The end result of platelet activation is something called the platelet plug, which is a short-lived temporary patch over a defect in the vessel wall. It's sufficient for stopping bleeding from very minor injuries. The second phase of hemostasis is largely triggered by exposure of tissue factor during vascular injury, which triggers the coagulation cascade the end result of which is thrombin's conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. Fibrin polymerizes, generating fibrin strands, which are superimposed on the platelet plug and trap red blood cells to form a blood clot. This is secondary hemostasis. There are many critical points at which the process of platelet activation and the coagulation cascade rely on one another. In addition, there are important antithrombotic control mechanisms as mentioned before, which prevent both spontaneous intravascular coagulation as well as runaway coagulation in response to actual injury. Finally, the enzyme plasmin is responsible for cleavage of the fibrin strands and eventual clot degradation. So in addition to our four to five phases, we now see the seven key proteins, collagen, von Willebrand factor, tissue factor, thrombin, fibrinogen, fibrin, and plasmin. There are certainly many other proteins on which hemostasis depends, and which I will be talking about a lot more in the next two videos, but these are the seven proteins you absolutely cannot forget. An important concept when thinking about hemostasis is that of hemostatic balance. Imagine a seesaw in which one side is occupied by procoagulant forces, and the other is occupied by a combination of anticoagulant forces and pro-fibrinolytic forces. In order for hemostasis to work successfully, in which the body clots in a rapid and limited manner when injured, but does not clot at all when uninjured, 
there must be a perfect balance between these. If the procoagulants are too active, the patient will start to develop spontaneous thrombosis, such as DVTs and pulmonary emboli when affecting veins, and heart attacks and strokes when affecting the arteries and the heart. If either the anticoagulants or fibrinolytics are too active, or if the procoagulants are too inactive, the patient will suffer from bleeding problems, which can be equally life-threatening. I'll end this introductory video on a quick overview of how to clinically distinguish platelet disorders from coagulation disorders, specifically those which cause bleeding. For platelet disorders, which may be either a functional platelet defect or a deficiency, petechiae, which are very small, non-blanching red spots on the skin, are common. This is a classic physical finding in thrombocytopenia, which is another name for low absolute platelet count. Echimoses, which is a fancy term for bruises, are usually small. Excessive bleeding after minor trauma or with menstruation is common. Bleeding during or after surgery is usually immediate. And last, spontaneous hemarthroses, which is bleeding into a joint space, and soft tissue hematomas are rare. To contrast that, for coagulation defects or deficiencies, petechiae are uncommon, though ecchymoses may be very large. Excessive bleeding after minor trauma or with menstruation is uncommon, unless the problem is specifically with excessive fibrinolysis. Bleeding after surgery may be either immediate or delayed by as much as a day. And spontaneous hemarthroses and soft tissue hematomas are common when the disorder is severe, most notably occurring in hemophilia, which is a deficiency in one of the several proteins of the coagulation cascade. So that concludes this first video on an introduction to hemostasis. The next two videos will cover normal physiology in much more depth.